Good evening, everyone. My name is Sam, and on behalf of Book Soup, I'd like to thank you all for joining us for tonight's event with Ian Brennan in conversation with Dr. Maureen Mann discussing music, a music manifesto in 59 notes. And I'm just going to mention a few housekeeping things um, before introducing our guests and passing over the mic to them. So tonight's event will end with a Q&A. And to submit a question, please use the ask a question button at the bottom of the screen. If you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, you are welcome to click the like button. It's kind of like a voting system. So if you see a good question and you want to hear the answer, um, you are welcome to bump it up in the queue. And we will try to answer as many questions as time will allow. And please also feel free to engage with each other and the conversation in the chat area. We'll be hosting more virtual events in the near future, and you can learn more about them on our website. You can sign up um, for our email newsletter. You can follow us on social media at BookSoup, and you can also follow our Crowdcast page right here to get direct notifications. And past events are also available on our YouTube channel. Please support Book Soup and our authors tonight by purchasing a copy of tonight's featured book. Um, you can do that by clicking the green button right below the viewer screen. It'll redirect you to our website where you can complete the checkout process. We do have signed book plates from Ian, so take advantage of that while you can. And then I also put a link to Maureen's new book from last year in the chat area. So highly encourage getting both books and supporting authors and independent bookstores as always. And we're also selling digital audiobooks and ebooks through Libro FM and Kobo for those interested. And we're also mm. open for in store browsing. So if you're local to Los Angeles or visiting, please come by the store daily from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. And we'd love to see you. And with that said, let me introduce our guests for this evening. Ian Brennan is a Grammy winning music producer who has produced three other Grammy nominated albums. He is the author of seven books and has worked with the likes of filmmaker John Waters, Merle Haggard, Fugazi, and Green Day, among others. His work with international artists such as the Zomba Prison Project, Tanzania Albinism Collective, The Good Ones, Ustad Sami, and Khmer Rouge Survivors has been featured on the front page of the New York Times and on an Emmy-winning 60-minute segment with Anderson Cooper reporting. Since 1993, he has taught violence prevention and conflict resolution around the world for such prestigious organizations as the New York's New School, Berkeley College of Music, the University of London, the University of California, Berkeley, and the Academia Nazionale de la Ciencia in Rome. I hope I said that right. And our In Conversation guest tonight, Maureen Mann, is the author of Black Diamond Queens, African American Women, and Rock and Roll and Right to Rock, the Black Rock Coalition. Oh, sorry. I didn't mean to blur that all together. Black Diamond Queens, African American Women and Rock and Roll, which is the one I put in the chat area, and Right to Rock, the Black Rock Coalition and the Cultural Politics of Race. Her articles on African American music have appeared in academic journals and on the websites of National Public Radio and the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. She was the Chief Academic academic advisor for Soundtrack for, of America, the 2019 Concert Series Commission by filmmaker Steve McQueen that opened the inaugural season of The Shed in New York City. She teaches in the Department of Music at New York University. And we're thrilled to have both of you with us tonight. So thank you everyone for joining us and please sit back, relax and enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sam. I'm thank Maureen. you, Sam. Hi again. Hello, I hey. how are you? No, I'm great. I'm talking with you. Thank you for uh, Thank you for doing this and book soup Thanks. is a great store so yeah thank we're not you there for in the person invitation. oh yeah yeah it's my pleasure yeah. my honor yeah yeah i was um reminiscing about spending time at book soup when i used to live in los angeles and uh especially loving the the newsstand that was there so it was good to hear that that's back up and that the store is open for browsing so um, yeah. for anyone who can go to book soup go and, and buy a book definitely Yes, not on Amazon, please. <laughs> so I, I, I think I'll just grab the mic and, and start by asking you a, a, a question because I really, or just to say, I wanted to thank you for this manifesto. Oh, thank uh, you. In 59 Notes, as your subtitle says, uh, because it's a really, it's a beautiful expression of your passion and your concern for music. And I think that you know a lot of people feel concerned. We're concerned about a lot of things in, yeah. in these times, um, but I think to you know to focus on music and you relate it to so many other things that are of, of, of importance. So I wanted to thank you for this uh, this critique 
of what's happening with music and the celebration of what is possible what, oh, that, thank you. with music and what music can make possible. Oh, thank you. I'm touched. Thank you. I'm glad that you've, I'm glad you found the value. So I tried. Yeah. <laughs> I tried. <laughs> so, yeah. So I wanted to ask, um, you know, Sam just gave a you know, kind of overview of, of some of the things you've done, but I wondered if you could talk maybe just a little bit about some of the work you've done, perhaps work that you have done that kind of led you to, to write this book, you know, because it's a very, it's kind of an unusual thing to, to write a manifesto. This, well, lots of people are writing books, but to write a manifesto is kind of a different thing. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about your background as a producer and how that connects to the things that you're talking about in, in Muse Sick. Yeah, I mean, I think, thank you. Um, I think that, uh, you know, it's a, the, the short answer is still kind of long, but uh, I've been playing music my whole life. I'm a, a lifer, like a lot of people, I think, that, that you have a real passion for arts, you know, the arts or a certain uh, area of the arts, film or music or whatever it may be. And, uh, you know, I never wanted to do anything else. I never could think of doing anything else. And I was always interested in just trying to be a part of bringing something beautiful into the world. I didn't care about authorship to probably a self-deprecating, self-effacing degree. Um, and uh, as I aged more, um, after having made horrible, horrible records because of my ego, even though I was trying to be humble, I mean, I had an ego, and. Uh, which is really just fear, um, I began to devote more and more of my attention to trying to promote other people, um, meaning being part of that process if I could. And and my, my dream is that I become invisible. I already am, but I mean, that I'm invisible, but these voices are remembered, meaning remembered more in the future than they are now. Um, that maybe 20 years from now, people will listen to Adrian Kezaguera and realize that he's better than any other roots writer virtually in the world. And just because he's mm. singing in Kenya Rwanda, he should not be dismissed as in world music or something exotic. Um, and uh, so for the last 10 years, more than 10 years now, my wife, Marilena Umahosadeli and I have devoted our lives, money losing labors of love, uh, going around to places that are underrepresented in, in popular music. And unfortunately, mm. they're easy to find. Um, you know, even within a smaller country, there's many linguistic groups, obviously. There's obviously persecuted groups like Zomba Prison in Malawi, um, who have it worse than most people in Malawi, even though Malawi was the number one poorest country in the world at the time. And same with the Malawi Mouse Boys, that they live in a very, very, very rural area, very impoverished mm -hmm. area. So that the, the, their experience is very different than a lot of other people in, in Malawi, worse meaning, um, and the level of isolation. So uh, that's what we've done. And we've done over 35 records um, in uh, over the decade, uh, past decade, you know, in, in different nations like Pakistan and, and Cambodia and, mm -hmm. and, you know, places we've gone and tried to do records, but records haven't resulted as well. And in doing that, I, I, it's been a, it's been an, you know, a lesson. I mean, I've, I've, a learning process, and 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 a, a lot of that comes. I think the good stuff comes from the people we meet when we're traveling. Um, they give us this this depth of understanding of the world and and humanity and ourselves, hopefully. But but the bad stuff comes from when you try to then interface with the the media powers, and and the manifesto is largely born, I think, from from that, trying to identify the patterns and, and just seeing, OK, mm -hmm. what you know, rather than just complaining about the system, like what 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 how come it's this way? And I mean, it's, the simple answer mm -hmm. is money. I mean, that, that that's why. So, yeah. So this is a, a very uh, clear uh, and incisive critique of capitalism, of, of capital. Um, a lot of the C's, I realized, I was, I was sort of making a list as I was reading <laughs> through C's. capitalism, consumption, yeah. um, and, and, and consumerism. So there were yeah. a, a lot of things that, that you, were, you were pointing at. But I also, I was struck by the form that you uh, arrived at for this manifesto. And I wonder if you wanted to say something a little, maybe describe it so that you know, readers will kind of understand 
what the book is, what it what it looks like, because it's it's a little different from, you know, maybe for a, a typical a typical book. Okay, yeah. I mean, I this is my seventh book, and um, if I'm anything, you know, meaning I'm good or bad, but if I've ever been anything, it's a writer, something I've worked very hard at. Um, you know, mm -hmm. since I was a teenager, and uh, you know, went through creative writing workshops where people would beat the shit out of each other and and try to make each other write better. Um, so uh, my thing was always being concise. You know, like like I I like short things. I like when bands come out. I don't need them to play for two hours. I just want them to come out and play for twenty minutes and be good. I'm happy. You know, mm -hmm. I'd rather do that than wait around for two and a half hours and then they get good at the end because they know they've got to you know deliver. Um, <laughs> and so uh, the, the, this book is is even more concise, meaning. There's three music books. The first one was over 400 pages. The second one was over 300 pages. And this one is, you know, introduces some new stuff as things have evolved. But, but I was trying to think, well, how can, you know, how can this be made accessible? You know, because I, I really am concerned about utility. When I, when I teach violence prevention, mm -hmm. I'm really concerned, like, what can you teach somebody that they can learn easily that can have a big impact? Um, so this book was designed to be a quick read. Now, when it was originally written, the 59 points were about 60, 70 sentences. Most of them were one sentence. And then it grew and it grew and it grew mm -hmm. and it became paragraphs. And, and then some of them became more than a page. And then at a certain point, you know, it was kind of like somebody had to just take it away from me. Nobody did. But I mean, I knew like I've just got to <laughs> just got to stop because this is going to end up being 300 pages again. Um, but uh you know I, I it's it's i think it's the core is there um uh, you know and and I, I i'm not sure it's right so to speak but i think there's a lot of things to think about and that's ultimately what what i always try to do is just raise questions more than you know provide answers questions for myself mm -hmm. too uh, but also mm -hmm. trying to establish trying to trying to identify those patterns you know because i think i think they're meaningful and i think we we need to listen yeah. to each other. We need to listen to people that have more experience than we do in whatever area. And 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 not that it, it's not binary. It's not like okay, I blindly believe this person. But it's like no, you know, if 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 you've had this experience and you can relate that to me, that's what we're here for—to learn from each other. And I should listen to that. And then if two or three people have had that experience or have yeah. studied something and they say very similar things, then. I better listen to that. I'd, I'd be very unwise not to. So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, hopefully there's some value. I'm glad that you found some value in it. I worked really hard on it. I mean, the shorter books I think are harder to work on in many ways than the longer books. Yeah, I um, heard a, a quote from, a, a, this is a paraphrase of a quote from a writer turning in a, an article to an editor and saying, uh, I'm sorry it's so long I didn't have time to write something short. <laughs> and just so that idea that, you know, it takes it takes time to cut things and, and whittle and, you know, yeah. make it succinct, yeah. make it concise. Yeah. Well, I mean, all this, uh, you know, all these rules, I think a lot of us have been exposed to, you know, writing is rewriting and, and that sort of thing. But uh, in be specific and, and mm -hmm. you know, the specific is universal, all that stuff. But it's funny because I was doing an interview recently with a pretty young guy, not that young. He's in New York and, you know, but he's in his 20s or whatever. And he said, he said, so are you more of a rewriting kind of guy? And I'm like, who's not a <laughs> like, 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 but he really thought this was like a good question. And I was like, well, if somebody's not rewriting, uh, unless they're Jack Kerouac on speed, you know, doing his, his 500 page, yeah. you know, scr you know, scr and, and, and in, in that one moment, getting his whole life on, on right. paper um without punctuation i think you're not a writer unless you're doing some rewriting and, and maybe a lot a lot a lot a lot a lot of rewriting so. right yeah and as as you were writing did you have a an ideal reader in mind were you were you, were you imagining an audience a type a type of music listener or music fan that you especially thought would would be able to receive this book did you have anything like that in mind no i try not to think about audiences i try not to think about uh product i try to the, the mm. process you know um and to make it 
as strong and accessible as possible. You know, w one of the things about this is not an academic book and I'm not an academic. Yeah. So when people read a sociology book or a music book uh, of the sort that that I'm kind of in the somewhere in the vicinity of, but not really. Um, some people have trouble with that because, you know, I, I don't I don't do footnotes and indexes and references because right. I don't give a shit. You know, that's not what I'm doing. I, I'm, I'm just I'm just writing about I'm trying to write evocatively. You know, I'm not trying to be provocative necessarily, but I'm trying to write evocatively. When I travel places, it's the same thing. I'm not trying to give a definitive view of a place. I'm just writing about things that strike me in the same way that I listen to things that that sound like something I've not heard before. If I see something I've not seen somewhere mm -hmm. else before, I'm going to write that down. And maybe I saw something weird that doesn't reflect the culture, but I'm not I'm not trying, you know, mm -hmm. to, to be anthropological. I'm just saying I was going down the street and there was a guy with a machine gun and and I went turn the corner and there was another guy with a machine gun. Um, you know, and 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 I think that you know is is specific and it's graphic and it's something that 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 you know brings up in an image so um you know I, it, these are not academic books and i respect academic books and one one of the many reasons i respect you and one of the many reasons i respect sylvia federici and one of the many reasons that i yeah. respect angela davis is that in addition to being really brilliant people you're good writers and that's rare well, thank you. Um, because I spend most of my time reading books that I I go through the, the the absolute labor I find to read them because I want to find one or two things that are worthwhile in the entire yeah. book, and 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 they're written in that that kind of cleric language, you know, dead language, like you know, you need like a Rosetta Stone or something to to figure out what the hell they're trying to say, you know, <laughs> um, and uh, and and. And I don't think that's necessary. You know, I think big ideas can be communicated and should be communicated in a way that hopefully they're accessible to anybody who cares. Um, and and I think, you know, I, so, you know, I probably am not capable of writing, you know, at that high level anyway, but I wouldn't want to because I, I find those books painful. Um, the ones I read on anger and violence as well. I mean, it's the same, mm -hmm. same thing. Mm -hmm. they're, e they're either redundant, 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 where they just rewrite, you know, my whole thing has been with the books, even the 300, 400 pages, I want every chapter to be something that could be turned into a book, you know, meaning like if I really wanted to be yeah. shitty about it and just keep rewriting the same thing in different ways for 150 pages, you could call it a book, I guess, you know, like a self-help book or a music book. But mm -hmm. I try to do I try to do the opposite. So, yeah, um, hopefully, hopefully the book, you know, it, it's certainly something you can read fast you know, and then go back and, and revisit, which some people that have looked at it have told me they've done already, you know, like they've spent a lot of time on these one or two sentences or, or on some pages. Yeah. And that's, I, I wanted to, uh, I wanted to choose one of your 59 um, notes and share it. Um, I actually chose number 58. Uh, okay. Because I think I think these I, I, you know I was trying to think of like how would I characterize what these are, uh, and I, one way I, I thought about it because they are very short, but they're very there's a lot in them, and so I was thinking that these are sort of like meditations, like these um, passages that you could sort of you could you could sit with them. So you could it's true that because there's not a lot of text, you could read through this book pretty fast. I had a nice cup of coffee this afternoon and I read, you know, through most of the book. But there's a lot there that you can, as you were just saying, I think that you can sit with and, and revisit. So I just yeah. wanted to share number 58 so that okay. you know, the people who great. are on the call can hear yeah. a little bit of the book. And then maybe you could respond. I know it's okay. kind of weird. I'm asking you to respond to yourself. But if you, well, no, you no. know, I, it's like yeah, I'll be hearing it for the first time. Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is number 58. Art is that which has reached the boiling point. It can be felt. Past that plateau, competition dissolves into sheer transcendence. Finding freedom beyond form, creation in the moment eclipses the self to expand one's own soul. Authentically generated sounds are as distinct as fingerprints. Rock stars serve as hedonistic priests 
engaging in accidental witchcraft. With the greatest musicians, every sinew of their being is given in service to the song. Yeah. Um, I mean, I really believe in music that it has the potential to save lives. I mean, it can't prevent a, a gunshot and, and, you know, obviously it can't cure a, a very severe mental illness. I know from my background in psychiatry, but it can still heal and it's medicinal. And it's something that, that I would die for. Um, and, uh, you know, you got to live for something. And the reason that I care so much about it when there's so much else going on is it comes back to the utility is we can do something about this. We can't do something yeah. so much about so yeah. many things. And that causes the cynicism that the people at the top want. They love it. And they love it when people from the left fight each other. They're laughing. They, they love that, right? Yeah. When we're fighting each other over definitions and words, they think it's hilarious, you know? Um, they're winning the whole time. And they're gonna continue to win yeah. in most ways, probably. And so these big things we can't do anything about, but we can do something about music. We can't, we really can. We, we, we can influence it. We can't change the fact that three corporations control 75% of the music on the planet Earth, recorded music. Um, but we can certainly do what we can to counter that. And, and one of the things is, is that, that's saddening to me is how much people have gone along now with this idea. Like it, it, it comes from identity politics, which is good. But now this idea mm. that, that, that pop stars, that they're, 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 you know, they're valued for their sociological impact. And it's like, but their music sucks and they sound the same. You know? <laughs> it's like, so, so why can't anybody say that anymore? Why can't, where, what happened? What happened to Lester Bangs? What happened to, to criticism? You know, what happened to the mm. idea that with your platform, that you're not just being a mouthpiece for corporations? Um, I mean, we don't need a think piece on Ariana Grande. We don't need a think piece on Ariana Grande. Ariana Grande <laughs> needs to be ignored. She's, she's got all the support she needs. So we need to write about other things, I really believe. And that's not elitist. I mean, you know, and this is what the right mm. did such a good job of doing. They recoded the word liberal to mean weak. They recoded mm -hmm. political correctness to be, you know, a negative, dis you know, societal force, which it's not. It matters. Um, and they recoded, you know, the, the, the idea of just caring about art as being elitist. No, it's the opposite. I mean, the, the, it's, it's a complete contradiction of what's happened, which is that popular music came from the people. It's the only thing that's yeah. ever come from the people. And it changed the world. And the corporations, they're so good. They turned right around and they assimilated it. And now who do we have? We have most of the people that you hear are from they're from well to do families. They're 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 from the one percent half the time now, but they act like outsiders because that's the ultimate entitlement mm. is that is that, you know, this this is the thing, you know, you see now more and more the amazing, you know, misdirection and, and, and magic show of, of, of a lot of people in positions of powers. They've convinced people that they're that they're of the people. It's like, how is that possible? How can you be of the people when you inherited two hundred and fifty million dollars from from your your father, you know, and 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 someone who who can you know it, you know identifies like oh we're you know I was an outsider and growing up and it's like well who mm -hmm. wasn't you know what does that mean you know <laughs> um, so you know it's 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 just it's it's very different than than the core and the history so we're left with the superficial aspects of popular music and and I think that's a tragedy because I. I don't think Jimi Hendrix would be playing rock music today, and I don't think John Coltrane would be playing jazz today. Uh, they'd be doing something else. That's what made them great. That's what made them amazing. I mean, just you know, uh, for two examples of many. But it's, it's, yeah, it's 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 hard to imagine what they would be doing. Some people have questioned, you know, would they even would they become musicians? Is there, right. you know, I mean, the, something I think about a lot is um, music education. Uh, right. like at the elementary school level and how, at least in the United States, at non-elite schools, so, you know, in public schools, there's very little music education. Yeah. And if you go to an elite school, if you go to a private school, you will definitely get music education. You'll have to learn an instrument. But at public schools where, you know, that used to be part of the, of the, of the structure, it's been shifted because there's this idea, and it's something that you talk about in the book, 
that um, art is extra or music is extra. Yeah. And there are these other things that are really more substantial and important. And that's what we need to focus on. And you're saying, no, music is, is substantial and it encompasses yeah. all of these things that we want children you know, and young people to learn. Uh, you can, you, if, you, if you're going to do music, you got to be able to count. You're doing math. You know, people have had to make those kinds of arguments to try to keep the arts yeah. uh, and public education. Yeah. But I, I thought something else that I, I saw in your book, um, in addition to a critique of capitalism, and obviously it's related, it's this critique of a kind of Western European approach to music and musicality. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that because early some of your first, and I didn't mark these down, but some of the first yeah. uh, notes that you made have to do with who is musical, who is a musician and how that idea, how that concept has been skewed, let's say in the last two or 300 or 400 years, especially in the West. Yeah, I mean, it's really a Western thing. I mean, that that the tradition in most parts of the world is that there is no audience. Everybody's participating. Everybody's on the continuum. And it's all this binary stuff that gets us into trouble, these extremities. Um, and I, so I think it relates to the bigger stuff, you know, the binary mm -hmm. equations, uh, you know, mm -hmm. which which keep people. This is history of damnation. You're either a good person or you're a bad person. What mm -hmm. kind of person am I? I'm every kind of person. I'm not celebrating my evil badness, but I have the potential <laughs> and it's there. And, and, and so, you know, I mean, you, you, people so much compare themselves to the worst. It's like, stop comparing yourself to the Holocaust, Hitler and the KKK. You can do better than that. Stop saying, well, it's not like I'm a serial killer. Well, that's not enough. <laughs> you know? um, so, you know, there, there, there's all this, you know, apology that's made for pop stars. And the big apology I hear with pop, for pop stars mm -hmm. all the time is, well, he's got one good song. One good song? You think that justifies somebody investing $30 million over 10 years? And, and yeah, that one song's okay. But my argument is everybody's got one good song. And so let's all offer up that one mm. song. And the best songs are oftentimes offered up for free. And that's not being touchy-feely, new agey, but it's, it's people communicate to each other musically when they love each other. They do it with sexuality. They do mm. it with their children in particular. Um, especially when their children are young. And so mm -hmm. in the West, you know, written music was the first form of recording. And that divided people into musical and not musical. And mm -hmm. then the next thing was that you're illiterate or you're literate. And then there's a division between audience and performer. Um, and yet in most forms, if you're not participating, then you're the weirdo. But we know that in the modern era, people, mm -hmm. fights break out at concerts because of somebody dancing at a concert mm -hmm. you know fights break out because somebody's singing along you know and, and and a lot of this comes back to the problem with how money corrupts the process as well is that yeah okay somebody paid 300 dollars to sit in the top you know the top uh, you know the row of the stadium you know mm -hmm. here in san jose to watch beyonce and somebody's singing along or standing up they get pissed off I, yeah it's 300 dollars. it's making it something more than it should be um, you know, because they're watching a screen. They don't even know if she's there. I mean, they, they literally do not know <laughs> if she's there because she's singing to a guide track. Or I, I shouldn't say she, but most people are singing to a guide track. Um, and, you know, it could be their double. You know, it could be their double that's up on stage. And the only people that might be able to tell would be the people that are, you know, in the first whatever, five or ten rows. But most of these big productions that are based on money, the division gets greater and greater. You know, like mm -hmm. literally... You know, they're deep in the stage itself. Then there's, you know, more and more security barriers. So the closest person is further away than you would be in most nightclubs historically. You know, when, especially look, going back to like the history of jazz and the history of jazz in New York City, you know, where mm -hmm. people were literally sitting on the stage. They were on top of each other. There was, you know, the, the musicians hardly had a backstage, if any, and, and they're just hanging out waiting to see if. If, if somebody will call them up on stage to play, like they're waiting to get the nod from, you know, one of the elders to come up and play. This, this is a very different system and it's quite right. a sad one, but I'll, I'll, I'll tell you about something about music because it happened just this weekend and I should share that, but I really want to talk about your books. I really was sincere about that. So I appreciate you, you, uh, you know, reading the book and I appreciate all of you said, I'm very touched by it actually, but, um, and, and I'm happy, I'm happy that you found value in it, but, 
the thing about music is this is that we know scientifically that with dementia it's it's one of the few things that, mm -hmm. that can have a positive counterbalance to dementia that can mm -hmm. reconnect someone uh to their to their self basically into their memory so my connection with my sister who has down syndrome she's 14 months older than, than oh, i am right. it's always been music um i would probably not be a musician if it were not for her um, um i learned about musical expression from her and her community, which is literally the most expressive community without fail I've seen in every instance from when she was three years old to when she was in her 40s and 50s, that when you go to a rec center dance, it doesn't matter mm. what's on, there, yeah. there's, there's a freedom of expression and a diversity of expression that sometimes is based on physical limitations, but there, there's, no, there's no concern with, self-consciousness about what this looks like there's just a mm -hmm. joy of expressing oneself mm -hmm. in music so my sister now sadly is is near the end of her life and she has become mm -hmm. also now nearly physically paralyzed mm -hmm. and I, um so i had not seen her in a long long time and she, and i went to see her on saturday because i was here in the usa and uh i went there and she was in the upstairs in bed uh asleep middle of the day not medicated heavily but asleep mm -hmm. and uh, basically barely could wake her um didn't seem to know who any of us are and so you know the, the people that, that are there uh helping take care of her uh you know we're kind of trying to you know like okay well that's that and 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 the people that were with me were kind of like well i, I guess you know that that's that and i was like no mm -hmm. i was like no no fuck that you know i i came all this way and this is my one chance uh, to see my sister. And so I, you know, started being a brother. Like I figured like, well, how do you reconnect with somebody? You do what you did always, which is probably not th the correct thing to do. You know, like, you know, I was, you know, a brother, you know, so I picked up a pillow and I hit her in the face of the pillow, you know, like, you know, not, not hard, but you know, like, 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 Hey, wake up. Like I'm here. What's, what's going on with you? What's your problem? You know, quit being lazy. And then she got, kind of angry and i was like good this is good <laughs> so then so then i went and i sent a cd player there and a bunch of cds all the stuff she used to love yeah. and i said you know where's the cd player because they claimed to me they were playing her this music all the time and uh, and i went to find it and it wasn't plugged in and it wasn't near an outlet so i'm like you're not they're uh -huh. not playing music but i wasn't there to confront anybody so I went and I put it down, I plugged it in, and she loved Tony Orlando and Dawn when she was growing up. And yeah. it turns out that Tony Orlando's sister had Down syndrome. So I always thought there was something to hmm. this, like wow. that his, his way of communicating through that television, um, he, he said he learned to communicate non-verbally because of his sister. So oh. I put on Tony Orlando and my sister starts nodding her head. Right. And I'm singing like, you know, full on singing, not caring, like that the people are around and whatever. So then we do a couple of Tony Orlando songs and I go and I get, you know, this is horrible music ultimately. Right. But but this is music <laughs> she loves. Right. So then I get the village people. I put the village people on, you know, and so I'm singing YMCA. I'm, I'm singing <laughs> Macho Man, which Macho Man has a very avant garde verse. If anybody's ever paid attention, <laughs> it's crazy. Like the chorus, maybe not, but but the verse is it's it's pretty out. Um, <laughs> and so um, I'm singing Macho Man. I'm singing San Francisco, you know, more obscure one. <laughs> than San Francisco, it's not so obscure if you're from the Bay Area. Um, and she starts singing and she starts moving her left hand. She's a left handed person. And so the woman is the primary person who takes care of her very sweet person. And, and she, um, she was like, Oh my God, Oh my God, she's moving her hand. And so I went and got Springsteen and I put Springsteen on <laughs> and I, I'm singing born to run. And, and she starts moving her right hand and she's singing to all these songs more and more non-verbally. And she's, her eyes are open and she's smiling a little bit and mm -hmm. she's looking me and uh, and then i put on the river and i'm singing the river to her you know and, and uh, you know you know full on you know all the words and 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 then she you know i give her a book and she she grabs the book with her left hand you know her dominant hand and then i try to get her to grab it with the right hand she grabs with both hands and and again the, the people that work there are we're freaking out they're getting out their phones or filming which i normally don't <laughs> like I was like that's cool you know they just couldn't believe it they're like oh my god she's yeah. back it's like she was literally resurrected by music and that may be the last time i ever see her in my life mm. um i don't know but she was she was there she was still there
um, but it, she was dormant, and the music brought her right. to life. Even the bad yeah. music. So. That's a powerful story. I, I don't I don't know if I agree with you. I mean, I I know you're you really mean what you say. I don't I don't know if I agree. I can't as a as a good anthropologist agree with this uh you know the bad music and the good music. Oh, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, you know, because yeah. you know putting that value those value judgments um and I certainly I love Tony Orlando and Don back in the day. I watched that show and uh the, you know all of those all of the artists that you named and even you know dear Ariana Grande. But I know that your focus is on artists who don't have that kind of platform yeah, yeah. Um, and, and that kind of reach. And so I wonder if you could, um, you know, maybe just say, I don't know if you want to talk about a specific example of, of some of the, the artists that you've worked with who um, don't have that, didn't have that platform, but that you and your partner have sort of you decided that you wanted to work with them. Um, there's a photo, the, the last photo in the book um, of you seeking freedom. Yeah. Uh, with with some of the, the artists. So maybe you could just, you know, talk about some of this, this other, this other music, this music that is not as easy. Sure. To access. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but yeah. that is still very important music for us to hear and, and, and try to learn about. Right, right, and yeah, and I agree with you. I, I, I do want to say that when I say good and bad, I'm, I'm being facetious. I don't really, <laughs> I don't believe that either. In fact, I, I write about, um, you know, how my, my evaluation of music is not good or bad, but whether it's, it's unique. So if it's something I've not mm -hmm. heard before, then I know it has value, and that's why I think it's so important. Because if, if nothing else, the musicality of languages, every language has a different musicality, yeah. and some languages are incredibly musical. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, Chichewa in Malawi uh, is, you know, the BBC, who knows? I mean, maybe they're not right, but they rated it as the second most musical language after Italian. You know, everybody talks about Italian being this musical language. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like the Ta language, which is a dying language, has 115 sounds. And I think Italian has 26. So just the wow. language alone, I think, is significant. Um, with the Malawi Mouse Boys, who we've had a relationship with for now over 10 years they're you know i they're they're you know really like family and and um yeah. you know one of the main singers one of the main people of the four i mean all four are important but his name is zondiwe kachingwe i mean that is a musical name it's a beautiful name and uh mm -hmm. so uh you know so a lot of it is just anything that's not in english is is a starting point and a lot of times people think mm. we they need to sing in English. I mean, this is a common conversation. Right. But shouldn't we sing in English? I yeah. mean, those that can, which is not the majority of people that we meet. Um, the flip side of that is people go, oh, people speak English there. Like, let's start with Italy. People go, oh, everybody speaks I English and Italian. No, they don't. I can tell you mm -hmm. as a horrible um, monolingual American that most people don't speak English. <laughs> Even those that do don't speak it well, which means that mm -hmm. I have a hard time communicating, uh, even in Italy. Uh, so uh, we've not found that to be the case. Uh, and, and what we're interested in is, is, is the people that don't have the privilege. And, and I, again, I'm not anti anything, um, mm -hmm. but I think that, that, that there has to be a distinction between somebody living in a capital city um, and somebody living in a, in a remote rural area. And yeah. some of these areas are so remote, you know, that you hear, Mark Zuckerberg, you know, like the, the, he thinks that, that the solution to everything is that people in Africa need internet. No, they need clean water and they need good roads. And people don't talk about the good roads part um, because we're still living in a physical world. And, yeah. and that's what happened with Ebola, you know, is that, you know, people are isolated and they're, they're on a good road. They'd be 10 minutes away and it takes an hour. It takes two hours to get there. We've mm -hmm. been through this over and over again, getting places or you can't get there. You know because it's been washed out um in a car so uh we you know i the what I, I firmly believe that there's music everywhere and there's music in everybody but everybody's on the continuum and i also mm -hmm. believe that there, there are truly exceptional individuals and this is the beauty of recording is is to capture those voices where the where the dead can speak to the living but i think that model that kind of genius model tends to be mm -hmm. only afforded usually to 
white people, usually white males, mm -hmm. or exceptional people uh, from African American communities, and pretty much mm -hmm. denied to everybody else. Um, is, and and you know, meaning from Asian communities and and even mm -hmm. from Middle Eastern communities. And there's a real danger in that. Um, so mm -hmm. yeah, we. I mean, obviously James Brown, obviously Prince, obviously. Bob Dylan for a certain a part of his life. Obviously, the Beatles. I mean, these they're like they're like Martians. Like they're they're like you know like like you know, like these are not you know they're superhuman. Um, Nina Simone was superhuman, but I think that comes back to the the thing that that you were reading point uh, on from point fifty eight mm -hmm. is that I think a lot of of the greatest artists really did sacrifice themselves uh, for others. Yeah. Uh, you know, not yeah. not that they're martyrs, but but I think that they really gave so much of themselves that there was nothing left. Um, you know, yeah. so you could, you, whether that's Kurt Cobain or whether that's Nina Simone or, or you know, there's other examples. Um, it's uh, it, it's when someone is really, really committed. Uh, it, it's it's like that idea, the writing idea again. You know, mm -hmm. that, that I think I think you know we all have, have shared versions of this, but. You know, when somebody says, well, how long did it take you to write that poem or how long did it take you to write that song or how long did it take you mm -hmm. to write that, that short story? The answer is my whole fucking life. That's how long it took. Yeah. And I think, I mean, this would be this would be the subject for another uh, conversation. <laughs> Sorry for all the profanity. No, but, no, but I no, but I think that when you mentioned Nina Simone and Kurt Cobain, and I was thinking of Jimi Hendrix, who actually has a song, yeah. Manic Depression. But I think, you know, something else, I think we kind of take for granted as we romanticize the lives of, of a lot of musicians is um, that the mental health component. But I think, you know, for many of them, music was a way to, was, was like a space where they could, deal with, you know, demons, especially, you know, in decades previous to where we are now, where we, we can have more open conversations about mental health issues. Mm -hmm. But, you know, you couldn't do that in the 30s or 40s or 50s right. in the way that we can do it now. And right. so you have um, these extraordinarily talented people who are also troubled and, you know, and, and you know, struggling with mental health issues. And music becomes a space to like process and um and to work through things so I, I think that you know in just thinking of the story beautiful story you told about your sister connecting with music that that we you know as you said we're on a continuum and people are at different places on the continuum but are you you know there's so many ways that we use um, music and when we access it and what it what it allows us to do um you use the word freedom i think a couple times in the book um and then sort of a, it's a, like a safe space so it's a yeah, really, no. it's a really, it's such an important, I mean, I'm biased. That's what I spend my time thinking about is, is music and musicians, but it, it's, it's yeah. such an important form. And so I, you know, that's why I so appreciated your care for it. Cause you know, we're in this world where there are all these other things that are affecting um, yeah. what we're able to hear, what we're able to access and also telling us that we are bystanders for the most yeah. part, that we're not. Yeah creators yeah yeah and and the, what you made i mean those points are really great and I, I the one that always i've struggled with because maybe it's kind of a pet peeve of mine but having worked in mental health because i had to support myself from the time i was a teenager and i, I mm -hmm. the only thing that i could think to do that interested me other than music was mental health because there was mm -hmm. a lot of history of mental illness in addition i mean my sister had down syndrome and that's not mental illness but but right. there was mental health issues on both sides of my family. And, um, and so, uh, I started working, you know, for minimum wage on the night shift, changing diapers to, with dying mm. people and eventually worked in the psychiatric emergency room. And that led to teaching people and violence prevention and verbal deescalation. So I, I have some familiarity with, with those worlds. And one of the things that, that I really am bothered by is when mental illness, uh, or mental health conditions are celebrated. Um, and but I think mm. what people miss and 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 ninety percent of the time or more this is true, is that Nina Simone was not so incredible because she was, was struggling mentally or emotionally. She mm. did it in spite of it, and that's how mm. in, incredible she was. Yeah, like that she could do that. Um, you know, this is this is I think something that people miss is that it wasn't because of it. 
And so they they latch on to the wrong mm. part of it. And, it. and it's very toxic, really. And it's it's very unhealthy. And they emulate it. I mean, I've known people. I've been playing music my whole life. I've known people that have gone down that path. Like, mm -hmm. you know, that that like, the Glitter Twins path or whatever. Like, they think if they shoot heroin, that's going to make them a good guitar player. It's like, no, it's going to make you a heroin addict. And you're probably going to fucking die. Um, Listen to me. I'm yeah, so, so yeah. profane tonight. Um, but that's the but, well, that's the romantic artist. I mean, that's the the yeah. image of the romantic artist, which is connected to this. You know, it, I think you could make a critique of that image alongside the critique of capitalism and alongside the critique of yeah. sort of the way the arts are cordoned off in Western European culture and, by extension, in in U.S. culture. I think there it's all, yeah. all of a piece, and. Um, so I, I, I wanted to say, because I'm looking at the clock, that if people have questions, um, and Sam, you can help us if, if there are any questions in the queue, um, please, you know, drop them in. And, yeah. Uh, we'll come, we'll, yeah. And I really want we'll to talk about, them. I really want to talk about you. And, and I'm sincere about that. And here we are at the end. Okay. And, and I could talk to okay. you all night. Clearly, well, ask, a, um, ask a question. Yeah, no, no, I want to talk about your books. Uh, and and so, I mean, I, I could I could say a couple of things, but one thing we talked about last well, emailed about last week was you wrote an amazing article about Sarah Dash, uh, for NPR. Um, and so you know, as a specific example, and and you know, I think okay. musicians, musicians sometimes like to act like they knew about something when they didn't, and I can say I didn't know about Sarah Dash, you know, um, mm -hmm. so uh. And I'm not afraid to admit that. And what I've learned, particularly with your article, is, is very enlightening. So that's I think that's a good place to start. There's a lot of things to talk about, but uh, yeah. Yeah, well, Sarah Dash uh, was a member of I think from my end, you froze there, I'm not sure. She froze for me too. Okay. Okay. Um, all right. Maureen, well, if you can hear us, you can refresh your page. Yeah. Sorry for that. Right when we were finally getting to your stuff. Well, let me, let me, while she's refreshing, just say uh, that, you know, I really believe in this idea that, that the solution to a lot of this is that if you have two things that you're presented with, um, two films, two books, two records, and one of them is from a lesser represented group and the other one is from somebody who commonly is heard from, uh, then you should consider uh, supporting the other. It's not charity. You shouldn't do it if you don't think it's as good, but if you think it's nearly as good or is good or maybe is better, for sure, do that. And so I always encourage people, don't buy my book. Please, seriously, don't buy my book. Um, buy Maureen's book, uh, buy Sylvia Federici's book, buy, uh, you know, the incredible book Afro Pessimism, uh, which was written by somebody who teaches creative writing. So it's extremely well written. Um, there's so many great books right now that are dealing with race, but that is written by somebody who teaches creative writing and, and it shows to a large degree. Um, and then after that, if you want, maybe buy one of my books, but please do buy a book um, and buy it from BookSoup, please. Uh, buy it from an independent bookstore. And if you're able, hopefully buy more than one, hopefully buy many. But but I sincerely mean this, that, that uh, I, I would hope that if you can only afford to buy one book or only motivated to buy one book, that please buy one of Maureen's books or, or a book by someone other. And, uh, you know, her latest book, uh, Black Diamond Queens, is amazing. Uh, her book, Right to Rock, is amazing. It's a real document of something I think that's so important is to celebrate the the diversity that that is oftentimes ignored and and i wanted to talk to her about that and hopefully when she comes back we can that you know she wrote that book it's it's about a, you know a movement that started with with you know rock in 1985 i mean this is you know more than almost 20 years before afropunk almost 20 years before tv on the radio both of which are amazing things but in 1985 that this was going on and and that the book is is memorializing that and and uh, and really helping to explore it and uh and so you know these are books that, that are important uh and uh you know uh, the, the the book the recent book black diamond king queens is uh one that does help shine a light in 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 places that that rightly should be uh 
well known, widely known, and and uh, sadly oftentimes are not. And uh, so we were talking about Sarah Dash, and one of the things that 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 I learned from from Maureen's article in NPR, because Sarah Dash passed away, I think uh, last week, uh, um, and it, you know recently, I think it was last week. I've, I've lost track of time a bit. Um, was that the group deliberately, as a girl, as a quote unquote girls group? deliberately individuating themselves so they did not wear the same outfits on purpose and one of the most beautiful things the quotes uh that that maureen talks about is that sarah dash who um in i in a virtuosic way apparently was the best singer in the group uh is that she wanted them all to be lead singers which is a pretty revolutionary idea as well that they weren't any of them were, were not going to be back up to the other um so you know this is this is uh, important stuff, and uh, you know, I, 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 the there you are. Hello. I'm so sorry. No, not at all. No, I'm sorry because we finally got to talking about about I don't know what starting happened. to talk about your books and well, technology. It's it's Facebook's fault. Let's blame it on them. Uh, they they need all the blame. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They <laughs> we should we should <laughs> probably by saying that we'll get shut down right now by the the overlords but um so we were i was saying a little bit about sarah dash too what i've learned from your article in the meantime but um you know I, another example of of uh you know what you've done so well which is you know shining light where it should be you know to the contributions of women the contributions of african-american women uh that are oftentimes uh not just sadly but kind of ridiculously ignored or overlooked mm. Yeah, and I think what I what I learned I think you froze up again there. Yeah. Oh no. Okay. All right. Well, we'll get to it. Um I I'll I'll, I'll talk a little bit more and then hopefully Maureen will come back. We got a little bit time of time left. But again, please uh Please do buy a book and please buy one of Maureen's books or, or, or you know, a book by another individual uh, that, that maybe, you know, is from a group. You know, if, if you have a choice between a book uh, written by a, a woman or a man, I would say, you know, if they seem equal, buy the one written by the woman. Um, and somebody from LGBTQIA plus background uh, versus yet another white straight male uh you know probably you know buy that book if it seems like it's equal or near equal um and again not just for that reason just because there's a, so much good stuff out there and 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 let's support the stuff that doesn't get supported as often um uh so in, in along those lines i i did want to mention that uh judith e human who is the person who's largely responsible for every wheelchair ramp you see every accessible bathroom in the world incredible individual who made a huge impact um i i've had the the good fortune to know and, and and be friends with and she's in the film crip camp the documentary again if you're on netflix and and you're not sure what to watch that's something to, to watch or at least try and i i think you'll you'll find it those who've not watched it quite amazing but um i was talking to her recently uh, because she wrote a paper on representation of the disabled. And, and one of the things she talks about is that the D that's left out of diversity oftentimes is the disabled, and to put that D back into diversity. And uh, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a film, The Blind Man Who, uh, uh, Who Did Not Want to See Titanic. It's a Finnish film. And it, it, it's one person on screen the entire time. And he's in a wheelchair, he has MS, and he's blind. The character it, it, you know, is in a wheelchair, is blind and has MS. And it's it, the, the actor is someone who's in a wheelchair, is blind and has MS. And he's it's a tour de force performance because he is the only person on screen almost the entire film. The cinematography is done from the perspective of somebody uh, who's visually impaired. Yet it's a thriller and it's a love story. And it's it, to some people, it probably sounds inaccessible and arty farty, but this is the thing about, you know, looking at two things and not doing it charitably, but doing it because this could be good. It, it's better than most films. And it's so entertaining that it won the audience award at the Venice Film Festival this year. Um, uh, this little film that was, you know, shot for almost no money and, and, you know, shot with one camera and shot in, I think 10 days they did it. And, um, has no has no score uh and yet it's incredibly entertaining 
And so what, the, what an estimated 67 actors have been nominated for playing dis, dis, people with disabilities. And these are non-disabled actors playing people with disabilities. And approximately half of them have won Oscars for doing this. Yet no uh, person with, with a physical disability has ever even been nominated. There have been two people that are hearing impaired that have been nominated, one of whom won, uh, but nobody with a physical disability has even been nominated before. So, it, it, you know, this would be the time, you know, I mean, it, 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 now or never, so to speak. And, and they're just, it's not charity. There could not be, I mean, this is, this is a film that could easily, en you know, enter the, the kind of the, the, the classics. And that's that place to transcendence that, that I, I think, uh, you know, I was referring to in the book is that there's no competition. You know, when you get to the point of, of, of songs that are just so amazingly well written or performed, uh, you can't say one's better than the other. I mean, to, to try to compare Nick, Nick Drake to, to Prince is insanity. I mean, to me, they're in the same space. And that's a space of, you know, where you are, your life is spiritually enriched by listening to them. Um, are you back, Maureen? Are you there? Uh, I see you, but it looks like it, sadly, it looks like it maybe uh, froze up again. Sorry about that. Um, hopefully, she'll be back in a moment. We're we're getting close to wrapping up. Thank you to the people. I see people have, have, have stayed logged on. That's greatly appreciated. Um, if anybody has any questions, you can put them to the chat, and, and I can try to do that. I can certainly keep talking, um, but I think we're going to wrap up here in a moment in any case. Uh but, you know, when, when we talk about stereotypes, I can give you an example just from today. Um, and that is that I was riding down the elevator. I'm about to go home and I had to get a COVID test. And there was a pilot, uh, airline pilot, I'm near the airport, uh, on the elevator. And there was uh, another guy got on the elevator. Like you're, you're let's say you're a white middle-aged business guy, seemingly. And, um, and so we have this brief stranger conversation you know three people don't know each other and the basic conversation was about covid tests and having to do them all the time when you're traveling uh and then i mentioned rwanda and and, and you know the, the the having to be tested multiple times and going there and the one individual said oh yeah they they really really had a hard time there didn't they right and that's not true um when we went there uh they only had a thousand active cases in a country of 13 million people They've only had, a, I think it's a few hundred deaths. And they were the only sub-Saharan African country, one of two African countries to be put on the EU safe list. So they've been on the EU safe list since the EU reopened and America was not. So I think this is that stereotype that is so dangerous where people are thinking in terms that are not really founded on reality. And obviously people don't have time to investigate everything. But, but for me... One of the big dangers, and I think what music can do and the specificity of certain artists it, it can it can help assist with, is that it helps us to understand the diversity within the diversity uh, of, of a culture. And, 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 you know, there are no small countries. So, you know, we did a record in Djibouti, it's less than a million people. We did a record in Comoros, it's less than a million people. Those are not small countries. A million people is a heck of a lot of people. Um, and in Rwanda, it's 13 plus million people. In Malawi, it's nearly 19 million people. In Pakistan, it's 200 plus million people. It's one of the most populous countries in the world. Um, and yet people oftentimes generalize about it. You know, they think of it as a dangerous place. And, and yet, uh, you know, it's, it's in general not. It's a huge physical country and it's a huge pop populace. And like everywhere, there's incredible diversity, not only among the populace, but with the individual on the continuum in terms of the diversity within themselves, their potential uh, and their behaviors and how it may differ from day to day. Even. OK, <laughs> hey, there you are. Hey, I don't know how long I'll be here, though. Uh, OK, something, something wacky with my router. OK, um, well, sorry about that. Well, yeah. we're, 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 uh, we've, I've been talking a lot about you and, and talking about the books and encouraging people to, to look at them and to read them. And, and let, let me ask a different question. I talked a little bit about Sarah uh -huh. Dash and what I, sure. what I'd learned thanks to you uh, about, about her and the fact that the group made this effort to not be uniform, literally to uh -huh. not have the matching right. uniforms. Right. Um, but I'm, I'm curious, this is a big question, but I'm, I'm curious that in doing all this research, 
Um, and one thing I mentioned to people earlier while, while you were away was with, with, with Right to Rock was that that was in 1985, you know, so that's way before yeah, Afro Punk. That's, oh, yeah. bef- that's way before, uh, you know, TV on the radio, who I love and who I'm friends with. Um, and, and, you know, and yet I remember 1985 that when Living Color, uh, you know, was very successful. And, and I remember when they when they came out, how, what a novelty it was. Right. You know, and, it's, and it's like, this is not the exception to the rule. This is the rule, you know, and and, uh, and Jimi Hendrix was treated the same way. I'm, I'm very ashamed to say when I was growing up, uh, up in the s- suburbs of the mm-hmm. Bay Area, which is supposedly a liberal place, he was the exception. And it's like, right. no, he's not the exception. So yeah. I'm curious if you can think of like, what what are three or even one, but what are, what are the mm-hmm. patterns? What, what are the stereotypes you hear about people in terms of just assumptions they make about African-American music or African-American uh, musicians playing rock music? Or what, what are some mm-hmm. of the things you hear that it just, you hear them so often, it just kind of like, you know what the person's gonna say before they've right. opened their mouth or? Well, I think one thing I'll say, I feel like I should talk really fast before I disappear. Uh, yeah. One thing I'll say is that I, I do think like the students I teach now who are college age students, that their attitude is really different from the attitude that people had when I grew up. I was growing yeah. up um, a, a little before the, the moment of arrival of, of Living Color uh, was when I was in high school. And so now it's a, I think it's a little bit different. There's a little bit more open-mindedness, but you know, certain, the main thing that like Black Rock Coalition musicians told me is that when they were growing up and they are contemporaries of Living Color and, and Prince, um, is that they were told that they were playing white boy music, that yeah. what they were doing was not black. Yeah. And that was and that was really the thing that drove them to want to, you know, make this organization because they always understood themselves as being black um, in both, you know, experiencing the positive things uh, associated with African-American culture and experiencing the challenges of being black and racialized in the United States. But they also loved rock music and they wanted to participate in that. And so they were trying to put these two things together that were being, you know, seen as separate and and not something that you couldn't put together. Uh, and then the other thing was that, you know, it's white boy music and that's not what that means. That's not what black people do, which is this historical erasure, which is one of my obsessions. And that's why I wrote this yeah. book about the women was to find the people who created this music, um, who have been put aside, put to the side so that we can focus on the white artists who who came, you know, who basically followed them and borrowed from them and modeled themselves on them and would all openly say that that's what they were doing. But in the the way it gets, uh, the story gets told in the history books, uh, it's sort of, you, you kind of put the, the black people to the side or they're, so, they're sort of the stepping stones, mm-hmm. but they're not the, they're not the participants. They're not full participants. Yeah. So those are, you know, those are some of the stereotypes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, related to that, probably uh, you'd asked a little bit earlier about different groups, but the one that I've we've run into a lot with with songwriters um, uh, from around the world is that people insist on uh, saying that they are traditional musicians, and they're not. They're not traditional musicians in most. I mean, some of the people we yeah. work with are right, and maybe they're playing traditional instruments, but even if they are, they're not necessarily playing them traditionally. But the good ones from Rwanda, the, the people continually say, oh, they're playing because they're playing acoustic music and right. it's rural, it is roots music for sure. I mean, Adrian's a farmer, um, but it's not traditional music at all. Um, and, and yet people insist on that, 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 that it can't be that he's just that gifted. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, yes, it can. And it is. And look at the yeah. history of music and, 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 and there's so much evidence. And the fact that that evidence is denied and ignored and erased is significant. It's mm-hmm. not pop music's not superficial. It's, it's, it's in our lives. Yeah. yeah. You know? Well, so. I think I, one question I had on my list of things to ask you, you know, if we had, we needed other questions. Um, Cause I think that thing about well, saying it's traditional is this, um, one of the things that happens <clears throat> with the West, Westerners like to keep non-Westerners in these sort of boxes and they yep. sort of hold tradition 
and then Westerners innovate and create and do new yeah. things. But the non-Westerners have to kind of hold tradition and it becomes, it's, it's disruptive if they are doing, you know, quote unquote, modern or contemporary things. It's, it's confusing. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, I wanted to ask you about world music, uh, right. maybe another can of worms, but just that, that category. And if you have thoughts about like, you know, that is a way that Westerners can hear some of the music, some of the music from places that you're talking about, but obviously there's still limitations. So I just wondered what you thought. If, and if, if you have, what, what language would you suggest? Is there another term that we could use to talk about that? Um, yeah, I mean, music. I think this, yeah, I think it's a good question. I think the specific term is international, you know, that th these are mm -hmm. international musicians, um, as are people from England, uh, but they're mm -hmm. English speaking or English singing. Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, English language music and Spanish language music and Hindi uh, uh, language music have dominated the globe, in particular English speaking music. And mm -hmm. there's no reciprocity. So everywhere I go, I mean, it's, it's almost like a joke. Almost everywhere I go, I hear Hotel California. I've heard Hotel right. California in the middle of nowhere. Mm -hmm. Yet I, I've, I always ask when I see somebody wearing a T-shirt of a Western mm -hmm artist i always mm -hmm. ask if they genuinely are endorsing that artist and they're mm -hmm. not they're just wearing a shirt that they got mm -hmm. you know it's a shirt um and same with the music i ask like if they know who they don't know who that is right i mean the the only western musicians that i've ever found that people know are, are is bob marley bob marley is, is yeah. huge yeah, yeah that yeah. that's real um michael jackson occasionally and mm -hmm. that's it rolling stones no way yeah no, way. no bob dylan no, no bob dylan but also no Angelique Cajo and no Lady mm -hmm. Smith Black Mambazo, you know, like mm -hmm. like most places in Africa, you know, they, they they don't listen to that, you know, because it's not in their language. And so right. there's this kind of Western idea that, oh, this is Pan-African. And it's like, well, it's a, it's a lot more complicated than that. And uh, so, you know, I, I think that if we go back, you know, the world term world music was used even in the 19th century. In the 30s, it was done as a local marketing technique when they were mm -hmm. still selling records as a way to get people to buy furniture, which means right. the big the big turntables. Um, and so they started, you know, making records of local music, not to be distributed elsewhere, but to get people mm -hmm. in those port Listen cities the all over the world to buy yeah. music and to buy the, the, the people that have the money to buy these, to be able to buy these. And so, um, you know, uh, you know what 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 happened in the in the eighties, which is kind of infamous, is that the group of guys got together. Joe Boyd is an amazing producer of Nick Drake and Richard Thompson, and helped discover Pink Floyd and all that American in Britain. Um, is that they were making records from around the world? It's it's not as evil sometimes people make it out to be. They were making records from around the world, and there was nowhere in the record stores for the music. Right. So so they were putting anything from Africa in the reggae section. Um, that was the only place they had. So they said, well, we gotta, we've got to create a section. But unfortunately, that section became very, you know, very segregated and everything mm -hmm. gets put there, even though it has almost nothing to do with one another. Um, but, you know, I think uh, just just one thing that came to my mind, mm -hmm. it's kind of unrelated, but I, I, I think it's something that, that you, I'm sure you, you think and talk a lot about. But it's something that is so important because I knew Cecil Taylor um and, and i really love cecil taylor and i went we spent time with him out in brooklyn at his house and, and in the neighborhood and um more than once and cecil taylor is that is proto-punk proto-punk is not mc5 no this is real i mean it's not yeah. just theoretical because no. mc5 listened to cecil taylor right frank zappa listened to cecil taylor lou reed had a radio show that was named after a cecil taylor song so that's, I think, a level of, you know, historical inaccuracy that that is un it's unforgivable because it's it's not it's not somebody just you know making these claims and people go oh, well that's bullshit and you're just trying to no no this is this is real like yeah. if if you trace it back further it goes back further yeah I think the people to listen to are the musicians because the musicians talk about who they're listening to, who their influences are. Um, you can trace the stories uh, through the musicians, 
the problem is when people are starting, I mean, they, this is oversimplifying a little bit on romanticizing the musicians, but the problem comes when people are wanting to sell it and they need to package it and they need to, they need to have a market for it. So they need to define yeah. a listener for it. Right. And then because it's the United States and we have a certain um, kind of a field of racial politics here, that's when you start to run into problems with acknowledgement and, um, and sort of making certain kinds of myths and what, you know, what, what connections do we want to make between artists uh, or among artists and a lot, the, the Cecil Taylors will fall away because Cecil Taylor isn't legible enough. And we're going to, we're just going to, we're going to start with the MC5. We're going to start with the Stooges. And, you know, they talk about the, the black musicians that were important to them, but someone has to listen to that. There, one of my colleagues um, at Washington uh, University in St. Louis has just published a book. His name is Patrick Burke, and he's just published a book called Tear Down the Walls. And it's about white rock musicians and black music and black culture in the 60s. And I think it's the first chapter where he talks about the MC5. So, you know, people are starting to do this work. Now, now that rock is sort of ossified, yeah, you can kind yeah. of objectify it in a new way and, and take on these mythologies um, that, have, that kind of held it up and sustained it for so many years and, and sort of, you know, pick those apart. So that work is, is coming. Oh, well, thank you so much, Maureen, for doing this. And thank you for all your kind attention to my book and all, all your insights. And I, I really could talk to you all night and I hope we can do something like this again, yeah, whether it's on again. the internet or in person <laughs> in New York or, uh, you know, or whatever. But, um, I hope, I hope, it was okay with you and I, and I, and I, I'm sorry that there was the moments where you weren't able to, to, to be here with us, but yeah. I, I think they want us to wrap up. So I, I would just say again, please buy a book and don't buy my book, buy one of Maureen's books or buy another book by somebody that might not usually get the attention. And then if you want to buy or consider buying a book, if you can buy more than one, look at the books and consider that. But I would yeah. strongly encourage, uh, looking at Judy Human's books or, or looking at Sylvia Federici's books who I mentioned earlier uh, first and buy those long before you even consider buying a book by me. So, Well, I, I won't discourage people from buying your book, Ian, but uh, definitely support your uh, independent local yeah. brick and mortar bookstores because if they're not there, you, I think you will, you will miss them. So while they're there, you know, take advantage and, and support them. And, and thank you, Sam and Book Soup for, uh, for putting this all together for us. Yeah, and thank you both for being with us. It was such a joy to have you and listen to this conversation. It was really wonderful. So um, if anyone thank who's you. here wants to share this, it is rewatchable. Once um, I wrap it up, it will be rewatchable almost immediately. And it'll also be featured on our YouTube channel. So um, please boost it out. And I can also go back into the recording and I'll make a list of the authors you shared and I'll just put it in the chat area. Oh, cool. Um, so that Excellent. people can come Excellent. back and find it. That's great. And That's yeah, great. it was Wonderful to meet you both and have you both. So thank you so much for joining us and thank you everyone for watching. And yes, buy books, independent bookstores. And there's two links right there that we would love for you to click. So do that and everyone have a wonderful rest of your night. Great. Okay. Thank you. Thank Bye. You. Safe thank travels, you. Ian. Thank you.